Decay by J. C. Moore. Mr. Cotter had nearly finished his luncheon when he remembered suddenly that it was his 73rd birthday and decided that he would celebrate it by a walk in his woods. No one had reminded him of the occasion and his post had consisted merely of the usual batch of accounts rendered and a disquieting note from his bank manager asking him to call next time he was in town. For the old squire of Cottersham was something of a recluse and he lived alone but for his housekeeper and two maids in the gloomy isolated Georgian manor. His wife had died twenty years ago and he was childless. None of his relations troubled him, except with brief letters or cards at Christmas time, for everybody knew that he was heavily in debt, and that Cottersham was mortgaged up to the hilt of its value. So Mr. Cotter was allowed to go his own quiet way towards senility, happy with his trees and his garden and his books. It had drizzled for most of the previous week, and he had hardly been out at all, Today it was fine at last, and a silver-grey quietness of early October possessed the countryside. The brown leaves spun down from the treetops without the ghost of a wind to speed their parting. It was a muggy, heavy, somehow ominous day. Mr. Cotter took his favourite ash plant from the hall and went out into the garden. Last night's rain still shone on the laurel leaves and softened the colours of the autumn flowers in the beds. There was a faint mist at the farthest edge of the wide lawn. Mr. Cotter paused halfway down the path for a chat with Daniel, his head gardener, who was planting daffodil bulbs in a border. Daniel was cheerful and confident, as befitted one who was engaged in laying up a store of April gold. "'We ought to have a nice show in the spring,' he said. Yes, good. Those dahlias look nice, Daniel. A fine lot, sir. For twenty yards, the dahlias blazed yellow and dark red, an epitome of autumn's splendour. They wove themselves into a rich pattern, like a carpet of Ispahan, intricately made to delight the critical eye of Hassan the confectioner. Yet somehow, for Mr. Cotter, Theirs was a disturbing loveliness. They were arrogant and defiant because they saw the leaves fading on the trees and knew that winter, with its withering frosts, crept closer every day. Their defiance was a gesture of brave hopelessness, such as men make when they laugh and sing in the face of death. Mr. Cotter wished that instead of autumn it were springtime, with the earliest bees in his garden and the dancing delight of daffodils, swinging their little golden suns in the wind, and he and Daniel listening each day to hear the first chiff-chaff. For there was hope and bright certainty about the April days, and only a terrible and insecure beauty about October. Once he had loved it, but that was long ago, when he was young, and when winter meant hunting and wildfowling, and had no connection with bronchitis, no sinister connotation with the steady onward march of decay. Mr. Cotter turned away from his dahlias, and went down the path towards the woods. Previous Cotters, living in England's prosperous days, but scorned alike greedy adventuring into newly found lands, and safer but just as profitable operations on the soaring stock markets. The former they had regarded as legalised piracy, the latter as an ungentlemanly affair, little better than usury. They had been chiefly soldiers and scholars, and when they returned from their honest trade of war, or from the pursuit of knowledge in continental universities, they had always been content to settle in their Cottersham backwater, where they shot and hunted, bred shire horses, and planted trees. 
Today, the great woods of Cottersham were their living memorial. But every sizable oak, beech or larch had a grim price upon it, and lived only for so long as Ralph Cotter could afford to pay the interest on the mortgage. Each tree had a chip cut out of its bark, and a number painted on the white scar. It was the first mark of the axe, as death, watching and waiting, will touch with his cold finger this man and that one, while the victim still laughs and goes among his fellows. Mr. Cotter decided that this afternoon he would walk through the plantation. It was a young wood compared with the rest of Cottersham. Mr. Cotter's father had planted it fifty years ago, a mixture of larch and scotch pine, and since then Ralph Cotter had thinned out some of the pine and put in quick-growing Douglas fir among the larches. The older woods around about consisted chiefly of deciduous trees. Beech and oak and hornbeam mingled their branches in masses half a mile deep. Little birches, as graceful as gazelles, made up the smaller coppices. Old dreamy elms and sanctimonious horse chestnuts formed an avenue down the drive and stood aloofly in the parkland. But of all his woods, the plantation was Mr. Cotter's favourite, perhaps because the larches and the young firs grew quickly and permitted an old man to watch the results of his handiwork, whereas the stolid oaks elsewhere took no account of human mortality, reckoning mankind's allotted threescore years and ten but half of their youth, and demanding as much again ere they came to maturity. Mr. Cotter did not plant oak nowadays, because he knew that long before it was sapling size he would be no more than mould for it. And he walked chiefly among his spruces and firs and larches and pines, and watched them grow up as he tended them. For other reasons besides, he loved these woods the best. The conifers gave out a sweet, resinous smell, and their needles were soft underfoot. There was no riotous undergrowth, no tangle of hazel and briars to trip an old man up, or flip twigs catapult-like into his eyes. Only the straight brown regimented trunks rose up all around him like a bodyguard. He knew them all so well that he could tell offhand how tall a tree was, without looking up to the top of it. He knew their moods, too, how they seemed to change their colour from hour to hour, and season to season as no other trees could change, how they were rosy at dawn, and golden at clear sunsets, tawny on bright days, and sepia on sombre ones, black in wet weather, and purplish in the late dusks of summer. They had a shade for every mood, and a mood for every person, so that their swaying branches mourned when a man was sad, and they laughed in their windy tops when he was merry, for they were friendly and sympathetic trees. They were not impartial and aloof like the oaks, nor cold and queenly like the beeches. They seemed to know how one felt when one walked among them, and to match their spirit to one's own. Only one of their moods was willful and incomprehensible, and they showed it but rarely. Two or three times a year, when the great winds came, they went suddenly mad. Then their topmost branches sobbed and shrieked like demoniac violins, crying aloud with a pain that was like the agony of poets when loveliness tears at their hearts. And yet close to the ground, where the trunks rose up straightly, there was always a queer and expectant stillness, so that to stand there was like being sheltered and secure in a monastery around which the turbulent world went its vain and noisy and terrible way. Perhaps, thought Mr. Cotter on these occasions, Cottersham was his hushed cloister, at whose gates a new world clamoured insistently, a world born in conflict and unrestful as the sea, a world of which he knew nothing, but which would soon engulf him and swamp his quietude in a swirling, choking flood. Walking between his larches today, 
Mr. Cotter recognized them all as old friends. Had he not personally superintended each thinning for over thirty years, weighing up the merits of this tree against the merits of that one, had he not planted many of them with his own hands, and watched them grow from foot-high seedlings to trees forty foot tall? Had he not guarded them, season by season, from high winds, by planting a shelter belt of sycamore, from autumn and spring frosts, from smothering by their light greedy brothers, from drought and cockchafer and weevil and rabbits and from all the other ills and perils of the forest. Whenever he went through his woods, Mr. Cotter looked out constantly for signs of his tree's enemies. Drooping seedlings hinted that cockchafers were busy, and Daniel would have to spend a day or two collecting the soft, obscene grubs which bit off the roots with their sharp mandibles. Peeled stems might signify rabbits or voles, which must be trapped or excluded. Gnawed bark higher up the trees was a sign of the pine weevil, the little black beetle with the long snout and the three gold bars on his back. Daniel's children must be set the job of collecting them, and paid a penny for every hundred they took. Nipped cotyledons and larches girdled near the top was the work of the squirrels, but against them, the gay red fellows, Mr. Cotter would take no measures at all, and he willingly sacrificed to them a few dozen seedlings and maybe a grown tree or two. Every season, the tithe paid readily because of their sleek beauty and the frisking gaiety that was theirs. One more foe yet waged ceaseless battle against the trees. Mr. Cotter dreaded it and hated it more than all the others put together. It was stealthy and invisible, and but for a single month of the year was its actual presence seen. At other seasons only its results were manifest. The trees swelled and blistered. Their bark peeled off, weeping slow trickles of turpentine. Their needles went yellow, dried up, and fell away. Soon the tree died and still its assailant remained hidden, secret, unseen. Then, suddenly, on a dank October day, as if in horrible triumph, it blazed forth blatantly. A host of bright yellow toadstools appeared in clusters around the base of the tree, rising up out of the mould to mock the dead thing with their dreadful living parody of death. For when Mr. Cotter touched them with his foot, they collapsed stickily, lost their flaming colour, and rotted, stinking. Mr. Cotter loathed them. Not so much for what they did as for what they were. They produced in him a sort of queasiness, a definite nausea, and a strange and unreasoning fear. It was with a queer apprehension that he noticed this afternoon a yellow speckling on the ground, and realised that the season of the fungi had begun. Unconsciously he quickened his pace as he walked towards it. They were toadstools right enough. They clustered round the trunk of a felled larch, and from a distance they looked like a patch of celandines or pimpernel flowering out of their time but they had not the innocence of flowers. They were sophisticated and intrinsically evil. Even their gaudy colour was sinister, unhealthy and obscene. Mr. Cotter remembered cutting down the larch last winter, because he had suspected then that the honey fungus was attacking it. He had felled it alone, that was before the doctor had forbidden such exercise, hinting grimly at an aortic aneurysm. Well, it might be. The doctor had asked questions which had nothing to do with Mr. Cotter's heart, and Mr. Cotter had smiled queerly in reply. The way of a man in his youth, doctor. One of the things which no man knows. That youth seemed so far away, so lost, so irrelevant, that it might have been somebody else's. Nothing to do with him. But here and there, amid the waste, was green memory. We pay.
said Mr. Cotter shortly, accepting the unspoken verdict. So it wasn't this year, next year, sometime. The last possibility had been ruled out, and Mr. Cotter was afraid of death. If only he could believe with the Christians that it was but the opening of the gates into a new and delectable existence. But the supposition was ridiculous, unreasonable. Mr. Cotter had a mind trained on the taut logic of the Greeks and the sharp, cynical downrightness of Horace and Marshall. Though he might subconsciously wish to do so, he steadfastly refused to play with the comforting nonsense about life in the hereafter. The theory was supported by a tittle of evidence. It was a dream of mystics and madmen, a straw clutched at by men, drowning and afraid. Mr. Cotter would have nothing to do with it. At seventy-three he looked death, straight in the face. But what a leering, hideous countenance it was. And there was no beauty in it and the very thought of it always terrified him. One's dust might dissolve into dust, help to build up new cells, new living creatures, in the old, unceasing roundabout of nature. But the soul, the vital spark, what became of that? Vacancy, just vacancy. There was the darkness, and the despair. It was said that there came to old people a great peace, the quietude of life's evening, so that they were enabled to await with equanimity the beckoning tap on the shoulder, which would come so inevitably, so soon. Mr. Cotter knew that it was a cruel lie. If any among mortals could face death calmly, it was the young, not the old, who could do so. For they felt, perhaps, like Peter Pan, that it was a great adventure, the solution of the insoluble mystery, the answer to the unanswerable question. But Mr. Cotter did not want adventure, and he had long ago answered that question in his own mind. He wanted to stay in the world where trees faded yellow in autumn and budded green in the spring, where he could plant daffodil bulbs in September and be sure that a golden harvest would gladden his eyes in the following April. Now he could never be sure. He wouldn't go easily, he knew. He loved life still, after his own fashion. He would have to be cut down violently, torn away from it, like that tree, the last that he had felled. He remembered the manner of its falling, how it had first creaked a faint protest and trembled slightly when he put his shoulder against it. One more blow, and he stood aside at right angles to the trunk. The larch swayed and began to creak more loudly. The creak became a deep groan, a crackle, a long shuddering sob. Then suddenly, as it came down, it gave that long, high-pitched shriek, which all living trees give when they fall a sound like the mandrake's mythical scream that seems to be verily torn out of them, a sort of death rattle, a cry of their tortured spirit, which leaves them unwillingly. Then there was a crash. The brittle branches split with the sound of pistol shots as they met the ground. A host of little twigs crackled a chorus, and there followed a minute's deep silence while the wood mourned the tree and paid its last tribute to it. The creatures of the forest paused and listened to the stillness. At last a jay screeched. The silence was over. The obsequies done. The larch, as a tree, was forgotten by the wood. It was become a log, and until it was cut up and taken away, the beetles might make their home under it, and the little mice have their habitation there. That was death, thought Mr. Cotter. One just ceased, and life, pitiless, urgent, went on without one. He sat down on the trunk. He remembered that he had meant to have it cleared away, knowing that it was rotten and diseased. 
He had looked under the bark and had found there the thin, firm, ribbon-like mycelium of the fungus, which would spread quickly to the other trees. He ought to have told Daniel to take it away. When one was old, one was always forgetting things. Mr. Cotter sat still, listening, as was his habit, for the small sounds of bird and beast going about their affairs. There were none. The wood was strangely, disconcertingly still. No jay, no little owl, no scampering of mice, not even the cheering flash of a squirrel's bushy tail. There was a mist on the horizon that looked like wood smoke, a colour which is somehow the predominant motif of October eventides. The trunks of the larches were bluish too, like half-burned logs, and everything was silent and damp and dripping. Even the log on which Mr. Cotter sat felt wet and slimy when he touched it. He looked at the place where his hand was, and drew his hand suddenly away. He was touching a patch of silver-grey fungus, which had erupted on the bark. He had seen it before he sat down but had thought that it was lichen, by which nature contrives to make certain dead things beautiful. But lichen was clean and dry, whereas this stuff was sticky and soft. Mr. Cotter wiped his fingers on his handkerchief and got up quickly. Dark was falling, and it was time to go home. In the house, beside the cheerful fire, he would read a book written by an old Roman poet long ago, and so forget unpleasant things. He swung his stick, and started to walk briskly. But before he had gone ten paces, he noticed that there was something curiously wrong with the trunk of the larch nearest to the fallen one, and went closer to investigate it. He stood and stared at it, then, with growing disquiet, his glance travelled to the other trees round about. The same strange rottenness had come to all of them. There were fungi everywhere. Their abundance and their diversity were such as Mr. Cotter had never seen before. Their forms were varied and horrible. Some grew out, bracket-shaped on the tree itself, like huge soapy cheeses. Some had the shapes of toadstools, and poked up venomous heads out of the soil at the base of the trunk. Some appeared like little blisters on the bark. They were snow-white, and spotted, and scarlet, and canary-yellow, and bright orange-red. Mr. Cotter had seen the latter before. They reminded him unpleasantly of the year's fashionable colour of lipstick. He had been up to London last summer and had noticed with a shudder that all the girls in the streets looked as if they had walked in the October woods, and kissed the horrible things, bearing away for ever the ineradicable mark of their madness. But there were worse ones now than the orange fungi. There were some which were parchment colour, and maculate, as if with some loathsome disease, and there were some more which were entirely colourless. These were neither white nor grey nor brown, the most that one could say of them was that they had a sort of greyish-yellow pallor, the colour of death, if that be a colour at all. Mr. Cotter had never seen them before, and a sudden unreasonable anger caused him to hit one of them with his stick. It bruised dreadfully, as if to show that it was alive, just alive, in its obscene and unhealthy way. It bruised bluish, then went green and yellow, like a rotting corpse, and dripped wet mildew down the tree trunk until it was nothing but a mass of slime, dripping and dripping, disintegrating altogether. Mr. Cotter stood and watched it, in fascinated horror. It was growing very dark in the wood. Mr. Cotter pulled himself together and turned away, he must get home. Trees stood closely round him, and seemed to be hemming him in. He must hurry away 
from these nasty fancies. He walked for a few yards, and perceived another of the grey fungi, its thick, pallid bracket, nearly girdled the tree on which it grew. Mr. Cotter raised his stout ash plant again, and smote it. A piece chipped off it, and a bluish wheel where the stick had fallen. Horrible. All the trees must be rotten to the core. Mr. Cotter stepped aside and felt something crush underneath his foot. He looked down and saw that he had trodden on a brown puffball. It smoked still into the quiet air. Mr. Cotter kicked at it, slipped, put out a hand towards the tree trunk to steady himself, and touched the big grey fungus. It was cold and soft, and it felt dead. Mr. Cotter felt a horrible nausea rising within him, and with the nausea a great fury, so that he lifted his stick and beat the fungus, aiming wild blows at it, one after another, until there was nothing left of it at all but pulp. Even as he slew it, he saw out of the corner of his eye another one at his left hand, and yet a third at his right. He ran at them and slashed them in turn. He looked round, and there were more on the firs behind him. He struck so hard that he broke the end of his stick, yet he dared not stop now, for he felt queerly that he could not stand suddenly quiet in the midst of those pulped grey things smelling the rotten smell of them. Darkness fell, and Mr. Cotter's breath came shorter as he went into demoniac fury from tree to doomed tree, seeing his own doom in each, while the October mist rose up round the darkening bowls, and the quiet wood watched. Today's story was Decay by J. C. Moore. It was read by Jasper Lestrange. Thanks once again for listening. Until next time, sweet dreams.